don't see there are very many of us yet. Give it a couple of minutes and then I will begin. I am doing respiratory system, respiratory anatomy today. And of course, the um, cardiovascular tutorial is, in the, is, is, is up. So you can do that one as well. And I will be dropping the respiration tutorial later, either today or tomorrow. Right? But I'm going to give it another five minutes before we start.
All right, so I'm going to start. You know, there's only 10 of us here. So we're going to begin respiratory anatomy today. Now, hopefully, you know, oh, by the way, can somebody verify that I'm being heard, please? Uh, maybe Alex or Candice, just let me know that you please. Being heard. Hello? Sir, I'm not hearing clearly. Come on, Alex, Christian, Candice, more than I hear, but not here. Sir, I'm not hearing what you're saying. Well, I'm asking. So, I am going to start now then. Uh, respiration. From CSEC days, we've been hearing about respiration, right? So you should have some uh, basic idea as to what respiration really is. Um, uh, you should also know there's more than one kind of respiration. Respiration includes all of these things. It includes pulmonary ventilation, which means moving air into and out of the lungs. So breathing is called respiration. Respiration also refers to external respiration or what we call gas exchange, right? So that's when the oxygen goes from your, the air you just breathed in, moves into your blood, or the carbon dioxide goes from your blood, moves to the air you breathed in. That is external respiration, okay? Then respiration also includes transporting those gases it refers to taking the oxygen and carrying it all over to the body to all the tissues that require it, taking the carbon dioxide from these tissues and bringing them all to the lungs to be disposed of. That is all still under respiration, right? It is even referring to internal respiration, where you produce the carbon dioxide um, during production of ATP. And when you use oxygen in the production of ATP, that is internal respiration. So please note, there are multiple types of respiration, right? Now, there's even cellular respiration, right? But we're not going to worry so much about cellular respiration. Now, we can divide our respiratory system easily into sections what we call a conducting zone and a respiratory zone the conducting zone carries the gases to the lungs and then carries them away from the lungs so everything that is involved in moving gases into the lungs and away from the lungs is a part of the conducting zone basically because this is a respiratory passages that carry air the site of gas exchange filters, humidifies, warms the air. All right. So this is the function of the conducting zone. Filters, humidifies, and warms air. Does anybody else have any problems here? Yes, sir. I'm hardly hearing you. Yes, I see what you said in the chat. You know, but I wonder if anybody else is happy. Yes, sir, I'm not hearing it clearly. It sounds like some kind of breeze or something like that. Breeze? Sir, I'm not sure, sir. I'm hardly hearing it. There's some kind of background noise. Can you still hear it? Not right now, sir. Okay, I guess I'll close the window. All right, you can hear me now, right? Yes, sir. All right. So we'll 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 continue. So now remember now the conducting zone is going to filter, humidify, and warm the air that is coming in, right? Then now when you get to the respiratory zone, this is the site of gas exchange. So this is now where yeah, your oxygen is going into the blood and your carbon dioxide is leaving the blood, right? So you're looking for the respiratory zone, mainly the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveolar sacs. And I'm assuming you all remember the alveolus from CSEC, right? 
Those are the air sacs. Now, the first part of the conducting zone is going to be the nose, okay? Along with the nasal cavity. So the nose is the opening to the nasal cavity. It allows air in, right? Somebody indicates that, I'm so, that I sound too low. Do I still sound low? Okay. Not to me, sir. Okay. I'm trying to adjust, but I, in my name, it says it's 100%. Anyway, so now, as I said to you, the nose is the opening to the nasal cavity, right? So air moves in to, to the respiratory system via the nose. Now, obviously, everybody knows that that's common sense, right? And once air gets into the nasal cavity now, this is where the air is going to be moistened, filtered, and the nasal cavity acts as a resonating chamber. It also has olfactory receptors, right? Now, let me explain what is, well, we'll explain all of these as we go along, right? This diagram here is a generalized image of your respiratory system. And I'm sure you know what I'm about to say next. You need to study this one and be able to label it. It can show up on final exam, in-course tests, lab quizzes. You need to know this one, right? Now that said, that said, we can subdivide we can subdivide our respiratory system. Can you hold a moment, please? Is it Sorry about that. Right. So we're gonna so remember now your nose is a nasal cavity is the first part of the conducting zone, right? But we can but we can also look at the other subdivisions of the conducting zone, which would be the sinuses, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, and most of the bronchioles. All of these are going to be parts of your conducting zone. Remember, as long as it's carrying the air down to the alveoli, it is a part of the conducting zone, right? If it is allowing the air to do gases exchange, it's a part of the respiratory zone. All right. So remember the respiratory zone, the respiratory bronchioles only, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs. Those are all involved in moving gases and gas exchange. Everything else is conducting zone. Okay. So nose, nasal cavity, sinuses, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, most of the other bronchioles, except for the respiratory ones, of course are all parts of your conducting zone. So keep that in mind, right? Now, lining your respiratory tract, which of course is mostly conducting zone, you're going to have different types of cells, of epithelial cells. Now you should be familiar with most of these cells from CSEC, right? But let's make sure. You all know what pseudotrophic ciliated columnar cells are, right? You should. These are the ones that look like there's more than one layer of them, but it's really just one layer, right? And they're ciliated, and they also contain goblet cells that make mucus. So you have ciliated gut mucus producing cells. And you find these in the upper part of the respiratory tract. So, that's the, so we're talking about trachea, bronchi, some of them are in the nasal cavity as well. Then you have stratified squamous cells. These are the non-keratinized ones. Stratified squamous is to protect against abrasion, against rubbing. So this is now found in the oropharynx and the laryngeal pharynx. Why is that? 
because the aura pharynx is the part of the pharynx you associate with the um, mouth. So when you're swallowing, food goes down the aura pharynx, right? And the Aringia pharynx, of course, can also will occasionally get food in there. So you need a little thickening as well, right? So that's where you find stratified squamous cells in the respiratory system. Then in the bronchioles now, you find simple cuboidal cells and they have cilia on them, all right? Remember that simple cuboidal cells are secretory cells, but, but and since they have cilia on them, they must be moving something as well, right? And the alveoli themselves are made up of simple squamous tissue, which means single cell, flat, easy from, from um, things to pass through them, right? So these are the four main types of um, epithelial tissue you'll find in the respiratory system, right? Now, let's talk about why you need pseudo-certified cells to begin with, okay? Now, as you're breathing in and out, okay, you're taking in air from the environment and that air is full of particles. Just because you can't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there, right? They're full of particles. Now, one thing that the pseudo-stratified cells are good at doing because they, have, they produce mucus is that they cause the particles and when I say particles, I'm including not just dust, I'm talking about viruses and bacteria and fungal spores and all kinds of things, a lot of them that are potential pathogens. So you want to strip them out of the air as, as quickly as possible. So as the air rushes in and the air rushes over the pseudo stratified cells, they have produced a layer of mucus on top of them. So the air rubs on the mucus and the particles from the air will stick to that mucus, right? And that way you, you, you capture these particles before they get down into the lungs. Just so you're, so the pseudo certified cells are helping to clean the air as you breathe it in, right? That's one important thing. Now, when the particles get trapped in the mucus, the cilia now, Remember the cilia little finger-like projections? These are going to push that mucus up or down, depending on where um, the cells are located, until they get to the oropharynx and then up to the back of the throat. And from there, you will you swallow them, right? So that, that dirty mucus now gets swallowed by you and it goes into your stomach, but the stomach acids will, will take care of it, right? So the average person, about 300 times a day, you'll find yourself swallowing. I'm sure most of the time you think you're swallowing spit or something like that, but it is not spit normally. It is usually dirty mucus, okay? That said, in some cultures, and even some Jamaican people I've seen do this, instead of swallowing, they spit, right? Now, can any of you tell me why spitting can, in, can lead to um, spreading of disease? So do any of you have any idea why spitting is bad? Or shouldn't be randomly spitting as if people are opening windows and spitting through car, win car windows or walking on the roadside and spitting. Why is that bad? Who knows? Remember, I just want to get your opinion. It doesn't have if you if your opinion is the same as mine, it's not a big deal, right? All right. Silence means I get to pick somebody. That's cool. I think I will pick uh Kimberly. What is your opinion? McKnight, KM. What is your opinion? Is Kimberly McKnight present? Yes, sir. What is your opinion? Why do you think spitting is bad? Um, because there is bacteria in your mouth that can spread if you spit on a surface. Absolutely true, right? 
So that's one thing. You can spread oral bacteria when you spit, right? Now, let's take, um, since everybody, where we're still in Corona time, let's look at Corona. Corona, of course, the virus itself is in your lung tissue, right? It's, it's in the mucosa of your lungs. It is in the, the mucus that you move up. So if somebody has, let's say they have the coronavirus, it, it makes them want to spit more, right? It makes it, it produces, there's more mucus being produced. So when that mucus moves up now to the back of the throat and the person coughs it up and spits. When you spit, you do something called aerosolizing. You know what an aerosol is? Basically, like one of those spray cans, um, spray cans with um, body spray or perfume or whatever. You're doing the same thing. You're taking the liquid mucus and by the process of spitting, you break the mucus into small little goblets, globules, I should say, that are loaded with virus. Right? Some of these will fall to the ground. They'll fall to surfaces. Right? So if somebody in class and they spit through an open window, for example, some of the spit particles will end up falling right back on the same table that they're using, right? As they spit out to the window, they have now let some of their, 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 their particles go floating in the breeze, right? So another person that will walk by shortly afterwards will breathe in, and they will breathe in these, these um, aerosolized particles and know them have, then they're sick now too, right? Or if it's on a table, you get up and leave the classroom, which is one of the reasons why we're not having class in person. Another person comes in, sits at the same table you're using, touch the table, scratch them nose, as we always do. All of a sudden, you've given them corona, right? That is one of the main reasons why we're sort of trying to avoid um, in-person class for a little bit. It's because we can't control people's behavior, right? And people say, it's just spit, it's not a big deal, but they don't realize that um that's the way you spread illness for example even your your common cold your common cold is mainly spread this way your common cold makes you want to sneeze and as you sneeze you throw mucus out of the nasal cavity that right and then that mucus coats surfaces that mucus will hang in the air as i sometimes you'll catch a cold you know where the cold coming from Somebody sneeze, walk down about their business, you walk in after, afterwards, you breathe in what they've sneezed out. Now you have a cold, you have no idea where the cold come from. Right? You go to the supermarket, somebody sneezing, sneezing, walk off. Five seconds later, somebody walk through the mist of sneeze and don't even know. Right? So one of the benefits to the mask wearing recently has been people have been getting fewer colds as well because it protects against that as well. Because if you're coughing in the mask, you're not spreading anything, right? But I do see people pull down mask and cough, which totally defeats the purpose of wearing the mask in the first place, right? All right. Now, let's talk about smoking. Smoking, and when I say smoking, I am referring to both ganja, cigarettes, whatever, okay? People have this weird impression that somehow um, ganja has no negative impacts on the body. That is utter rubbish, All right? The main difference between, as a matter of fact, in terms of carcinogenic chemicals, there's, there are more carcinogens in ganja than there, is, than, than there are in tobacco. There's more tar in the ganja cigarettes. The reason why there's a, a massive increase in, in lung cancer due to ganja is the way people smoke the ganja. By that I mean, there's about three times more tar in ganja than a, than a regular cigarette, right? So the average person ain't smoking more than one or two spliffs a day if so much, I doubt the average person smokes a spliff a day, right? If you're a heavy user, you might smoke a six spliff a day, seven spliff a day, right? But that is not the norm. Whereas if somebody's smoking cigarettes, they can easily go through two packs of cigarettes a day, a pack of cigarettes a day. A pack of cigarettes is about 20 cigarettes. So if, so if you're going through a pack of cigarettes a day, 
even though the ganja is three times worse than smoking one spiff for the same day, the cigarettes is going to be worse because of the quantity you're smoking, right? But if you are a continuous, regular user of, of um, marijuana, your risk of getting lung cancer does still increase, all right? All right. So that's one thing smoking does. It increases your risk of carcinoma or cancer, okay? Smoking also causes the destruction of the alveoli in the lungs. They get damaged. And because of that, you develop um, a condition called emphysema, in which the alveoli gets so damaged that they, they, the surface area is reduced. And because of that, smokers get less oxygen um, with every breath they take, right? Now, once again, it is more prominent in people who smoke tobacco cigarettes because you're smoking more of the cigarettes. So there's more smoke being introduced into your lungs at a given time. So that's what makes it worse. So if people smoke ganja the way they smoke regular cigarettes, there'd be far more lung cancer. Right? So, I will say, between the two of them, based on the unregular use, smoking one spiff a day it's far better than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, right? But what's better than both of them is not smoking at all. So, but that's up to you, right? All right, now, I mentioned um, the, the rest of bronchioles already, right? But it says they're, um, they are made of simple cubital epithelium, which you mentioned already. I mentioned that they also have cilia on them. And the rest of bronchioles, or at least the mucosa of the small bronchioles, I should say, they help to trap mucus as well, right? And when you cough, you help to push this mucus out of the lungs, out of the bronchioles to get rid of it. Now, people who smoke, there are a lot more particles in their lungs, which means that they produce a lot more mucus, and that mucus has to be removed more often. So people who smoke regularly, they cough more regularly as well to dislodge this mucus that is building up inside their lungs, to remove it from their, the rest of their mucosa, right, to clear it so they can breathe properly, right? And by the way, if you are a regular smoker, let's say you're somebody who smoked for 10 years and decided to quit, it takes you three to five years to um, recover 70% of your lung capacity. So even after you smoke, it takes you years and years and years to get back a portion of what you lost. And you will never get back the full 100, right? Now, going down now past the respiratory bronchioles into our alveoli. Remember, the alveoli are single celled there and they're very flat, it's like a sheet of paper. And because of that, it is very, very easy for, for, for gases to pass right through them as they are so thin and move into the capillaries. Or for gases to move out of the capillaries and move into the alveolar airspace. So this is why you need um, the sib square muscles for gas exchange because they're so thin and, and so permeable to gases, right? This here now is, I said, this is looking at the upper respiratory tract only, right? The initial diagram I showed you here is the whole thing, is upper and lower, right? But I wanted to notice, that as I said to you earlier, this is a generalized look at the respiratory system. Whereas this diagram here now is more specific the upper part of the respiratory system and it shows you more detail for example here in the nasal cavity it shows you things called conchae and meatuses it shows you nasal vestibule that's the ear when you look up the upper look, 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 look in the nose well i'll show you in a minute right so this diagram here gives you more detailed information than the, the initial one which of course means this one you also have to learn it Right? So far, there are two diagrams I've said here that you definitely need to know, right?
But of course, this one just adds a few things to the original diagram, so it's not that difficult, right? All right, um, let's, let's look at the structure of the nose itself. Now, of course, you know the nose is made up mainly of cartilage, right? The hole in the nose, uh, the nose hole, as we say, is called the vestibule, right? So the nasal vestibule refers to a hole. Now, you'll note that the nasal vestibule contains a lot of hairs, okay? Now, something I mentioned to the class earlier is that um, the, the coarseness of the hair is actually somewhat genetic. By that I mean people of Northern European descent tend to have more hair in the nose, but the hair tends to be less coarse. Whereas people of strong African descent tend to have less nose hair, but the hair tends to be coarser, right? And it has to do with what the hair is designed to do. If for, a, for a, let's, let's, say, let's say for a black person from Africa, the nose hair, or African descent, I should say, is designed to filter out particles out of the air, reasonably large particles, like sand, which are moderately heavy. So you need a fairly heavy nose hair to um, deflect, let's call it. The, the, those um, sand grains, right? So that is why the nose here of a black person, there are fewer hairs, but they are thicker, right? Compare that to a white person, as I said, Northern European descent, they have a lot more fine hairs. That's because the hairs now are designed to filter out um, not, not merely dust, which is heavy with sand, but snow. It's easy for these little fine hairs, large number of fine hairs. To have the, the um the snowflakes stick to them so you that, that so that, that person won't breathe in snow as easily right so even the hair is in the nose there's a reason they're there and there's a reason they're the way they are right then now the septum this is the septum right here at least the, 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 a part of it the septum divides the nasal vestibule into two, so you have two vestibules, right? And it goes right back. As it says here, it is hyaline cartilage, and of course, it is fused, a fusion of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and the vomer bone. You should remember your, your, your facial bones from AMP1, hopefully, right? So here we have the nasal bone, here of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, and down here you have the, the, um, the vomer bone. Now the rest of this here is cartilage, right? So the bulk of the septum is cartilage. Because it's cartilage, it means that the nose can be broken fairly easily. So people get into fist fights, you know, the, 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 the punches are flying, they get punched in the face. Normally you have to get punched laterally to the jaw, to the, to the nose, and it causes the nose to break. When it says somebody's nose breaks, they normally mean the septum gets broken. And when that happens, the septum shifts out of position. So when, so when you look at the person's nose, the nose looks like it's bent at an angle. Normally, I go to the hospital, the doctor will just grab the nose, pull it straight, right? And then assuming the doctor is good at what he's doing, it will realign the nose properly. And over the course of a few weeks, the nasal cartilage, the septum, will heal, and it will heal straight. If your doctor doesn't know what they're doing so much, sometimes when the nose heals, the heel, the nose will heal with a bend in, bend in it. So the septum is now bent. And that can cause breathing problems, you know, snoring, these kind of things if, if, if your septum is bent, right? And the only way to fix it is, of course, to re-break the septum, straighten it, and then have it heal again, right? Then now, bones of the nasal cavity. You're going to need to remember the names of these bones because it is very easy to get multiple choice questions from these bones. Which of the following is not considered a bone that makes up the nasal cavity? Right? Examples of a question. I can do about six different multiple choice just from that alone. But please make sure you know that the bones of the nasal cavity include the maxillary bone, nasal bone, frontal bone, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones, right? As well as portions of the maxillary and palatine bones, right? 
So make sure you know the names of the, of the bones and where they're located. Plenty of multiple choice can come from that. Now, also I'd like to talk about the soft palate. The soft palate and the hard palate um, are separating the pharynx, okay? Now above, this, this, the hard palate here separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity, right? So the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. That's what the hard palate does. But when you go back from the hard palate, you form the soft palate all the way down to the uvula. The only thing you say that back of your throat, right? Now, the purpose of the, uh, of the soft palate is to separate the oropharynx from the nasopharynx. So the oropharynx is down here, so the nasopharynx is up here. So the soft palate separates the oropharynx from the nasopharynx, right? That way, food isn't constantly going up through your nose, right? That would be strange, right? Then now, so you can see the uvula here. That's your uvula. That's the soft palate, right? And there you can see your tonsils on either side. Those are the palatine tonsils, right? And back behind here, now that's the oropharynx. So when you swallow, you push food to the oropharynx, and then from there, you automatically swallow the food down, right? Food, of course, goes to the esophagus, right? And when you're breathing, of course, the air comes to the nasopharynx, come down to the oropharynx, then the epiglottis pops open, and, and directs the air down into the trachea, right? So keep that in mind. Now, in terms of the nasal cavity, you're going to have, I, I think I mentioned to you before, this is where you, 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 you're, you're going to have olfactory cells. Remember that olfactory cells are going to be involved in you detecting smells, right? So this includes now, the, you'll form, find them on the, what you call the cribriform plate. The upper part or superior part of the nasal septum, remember what was the septum a second ago, as well as parts of the nasal concha. And I want to mention what the concha are, right? What we're looking at here is a more detailed diagram of the nasal pharynx, okay? I want you to notice that you have these things here called turbinates, they are a part of the concha. So you have a superior turbinate, which is the same as superior concha. Middle terminate, middle concha. Inferior turbinate is inferior concha. So they look, they look like little ridges, right? And between them now you have little channels. We call these channels the meatus, M-E-A-T-U-S. So you have concha, and on the concha you'll have um, olfactory cells, and running between them you have meatus which are ridges that help to direct air as you breathe through, right? Now you're probably wondering, why is it that this thing is so um, complicated, right? Why do you need meatuses to act as air passages between the conker? What is the purpose of the conker in the first place? What, what is all of this mix up about? Here's the reason, uh, here's the reason. It comes back to the functions of the upper respiratory system, right? Most of them are going to be done in the, in the, in the um, nasal cavity. When you breathe air in, you remember I mentioned to you earlier that um, you need pseudostratified epithelial cells to produce mucus. And some of them are in the nasal cavity too. So, and, and the mucus is used to clean the air. So when you breathe in, the air rubs against the mucus and the air gets clean, right? Now, if the nasal cavity was completely flat, and smooth when you breathe in only a little bit of the air you breathe in would get um it would get filtered only a little bit of it would be rubbing against the side walls of the nasal cavity right so what the meatuses and the conker do is when you breathe in 
they cause the air to swirl all about the place. So the air isn't just, um, it doesn't take a straight line through. It forces the air to swirl around and as it swirl around and passing um, it's, uh, down the matos, air rubs against the conch as it's swirling around, which means more of the air is rubbed against the nasal cavity. And that of course means more of the foreign particles, the viruses, the bacteria, the fungi, the dust, whatever it is, get stuck to that, um, to that mucus, right? So you breathe in, you swirl the air around, you pass the swirling air through the matuses, they rub on the conquer, and you clean the air. You just breathe in without any of these structures, only without swirling the air around first, a smaller amount of air will get clean, right? That's one thing that the, that the conquer and the matuses are good for, but there are others. So, so as it says here, creates turbulence and incoming air allows for cleaning the air. But see, this makes sense to you now. If you've ever been out in the sun, which I assume you have been, and the day is hot and the day is dry, right? And you breathe in for an extended period, you actually feel like a burning sensation in your, in your lungs sometimes. What you're feeling is your lungs, are, the lung tissue starting to get dehydrated because you're losing water so fast. So every time you breathe out, you're losing water, right? But see, this makes sense to you. If you breathe in that very hot, very dry air and that went straight down into your lungs, it would dehydrate your lungs even faster. So when you breathe in and you're swirling the air around, one of the things that happens in the nasal cavity is that the mucus will also have water in there. And water vapor from that mucus will go into this very dry air. It will humidify the air. So when the air gets to your lungs, it won't be as harsh on your lungs. It's not perfect, obviously. But without it, you dehydrate and die extremely quickly, right? So this is, a, is an example we can point to that says, yeah, human beings evolved in some place that was hot, and dry. Because the place wasn't hot and dry, you would need to be moisturizing the air before you send it to the lungs, right? So that makes sense. But also because you have your olfactory cells on the conquer, as, as, as well as the cribriform plate, as you're swirling the air, you're breathing in around the, the olfactory bulb from the plate, as well as the cells on the conquer, is you're more likely to get scent molecules to stick to your um to your to your olfactory cells. So you swirl the air around. It's easier to smell what is in the air, as you increase the chances of um, whatever you're breathing in getting stuck to um, an olfactory cell. See, I, I'm I'm sure everybody does this, but let me let me see. You're trying to smell something, let's say that's cold or something, you're not quite getting the smell. So use your hand and kind of waft the smell towards your nostrils, right? As you're doing that, you're forcing more of the air from that area into your nostrils. But you're also accelerating the air so that when it gets into the, into the nasal cavity, it spins even faster. That increases your chance of smelling it, right? So that is why we with here create any currents that bring olfactory stimuli to olfactory receptors. That's what it means. You swirl the air around and rub the air against the olfactory cells and increase the chances of you smelling whatever it is you're breathing in, right? Then now we have um, the sinuses. You should have done the sinuses at um, the AMP one as, again, so you should know what they are. But just remember the sinuses are there to lighten the skull, they make the skull less heavy, right? But in addition to that, the sinuses are aligned with a mucous membrane, which means that they're also producing mucus, right? Which helps to keep them clean. Now, this, these um, sinuses, the paranasal sinuses, are what, of course, leads to a sinus infection because the sinuses are linked, of course, to the nasal cavity. As I say, you have the osteometal ducts, that link your sinuses, your paranasal sinuses to the nasal cavity. 
So let's say you're once again minding your own business. Somebody up the road sneezes. You walk through their sneeze afterwards. You breathe in the cold virus. The cold virus makes its way from your nasal cavity via the osteometal ducts into your nasal sinuses. Now all of a sudden, you have the cold virus in your sinuses. So what happens? Your sinus, the, the mucous membrane start to produce a massive amount of mucus to try and get rid of the cold virus. Enough that you can block the sinuses. So all of a sudden now, you have a sinus headache. All of a sudden now, the sinus is, is leaking mucus into your nasal cavity or leaking mucus into your oral cavity, right? Which of course can give you a, a throat infection as well, right? Because they're, remember, they're linked together. Now, sinusitis, which is the swelling of sinuses, you'll have the inflammation of the sinus lining. And as I mentioned to you, you're gonna have excess mucus production. So you'll have it draining either to the back of your throat or draining into your nasal cavity. So a person will have a runny nose, basically, right? And, or they're constantly swallowing. These are signs of sinus infection, right? Now, you also have nasolacrimal ducts. Hopefully you remember that the lacrimal gland produces tears. So that, that's a tear gland, right? Now, you have a, a duct leading from the tear gland that goes into your nasal cavity, right? So yes, you have one at the corner of your eye, but you also have one that goes into the nasal cavity. And here's why that's important. Please remember that the purpose of tears is not to let everybody know that you're sad, right? There's a biological purpose for them. They clean. So when your eyes tear up and you blink, you're taking some of the, the, the um, fluid from your eye and you're washing it over your eyeball and it cleans the eyeball. When your nose is running like that, the nasal lacrimal um, gland is, is um, a sack, I should say, is leaking tear gland, tears basically into your nasal cavity, which helps to clean them, right? So, that, so in, in a way, it's almost as if you're crying through your, through your nose hole, which is, sounds like ridiculous. But that's basically what you're doing, right? Um, with the other class, I stopped here, so I'm gonna stop here as well. And I think Miss Martin will probably pick up from here. That said, um, I have not yet posted the respiratory um, tutorial. I will do so over the weekend, I mentioned that earlier. The, the, the cardiovascular one is there for you to do, right? There were some questions there that the, the diagrams weren't showing up. I, I deleted them, so you should be fine now, right? Now, are there any questions about what we've just gone through? Now is a good time to ask. Well, all right. I guess that means you're all good to go. Okay. All right, then. So I guess I'll stop here then. Sir. Yes, go ahead. This is not a question relating to the question you asked, but where do you put the recordings for these classes? Well, this is the first um, class we've had, right? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link to it in the tutorial. So you can go back to the tutorial later today and you should be able to find the video. I'll post on YouTube later today. Okay. Uh, sir. Go ahead. Good day. Um, could may I have a link to the tutorial? On my timetable, it is saying um, Friday. It is saying um, what time is that? Give me a sec. What do you mean a link to the tutorial? You, you lost me. When is the tutorial time? Because what I have, what I see on Where? Moodle here, is not what I have on my timetable. Okay. What do you have in Moodle? Hold on. Mr. So, oh, Friday, 10 to 11. And my, I thought I was having tutorial now. You are having tutorial now. No. 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 All right. You are having tutorial now, right? The, the reason. But Moses said lab, it's lab, Friday, 1 to 3 p.m. Okay, I do not think about that. Um, maybe it means that you're actually in the 10 o'clock tutorial. Okay. 
No man, this is my tutorial time, but it's not reflecting what is on Moodle. It's, it, it is saying it's love. So I just joined the class anyway, because I am at the time. I didn't know it was a tutorial. Because Moodle said it was lab time, Friday, 1 to 3 p.m. Oh, I don't know. I just, wrote it off, I just wrote it off a while ago. I know I don't have any labs that time, but I think Miss Martin has a lab at that time. All right, then. So you're going to need to get her um, Schoology link. Do you have the tutorial link for my class? No. I'm going to post it in the chat right now. I'm not in a chat, that chat neither. What do you mean you're not in the chat? We're literally talking right now. Okay, thanks. I thought they had a, maybe a WhatsApp group or something. No, man. No, I mean the Schoology, um, Zoom chat. The Zoom link, okay. Yeah, so let's take that follow it to um, the courses and their tutorials are there. Okay, that is also that where I'll post the link to this lecture. Normal, as I said, we'll have a tutorial, not a lecture, but because um, you're a little bit behind, I'm, I'm trying to help you to catch up. Okay, thanks for that. I know Miss Martin um, didn't get to her class this week because she had some, some issues getting to her computer. Um, so I'm, I'm more than likely next week I'll be doing a lecture as well. We're going to try and catch up as, as soon as we can. All right, any other questions? All right. So remember now, I will be posting a link to um the, the, what we've just done. It's probably about two hours or so. You can check back the um scholarly link for the tutorials, and you can listen to it at your leisure. Right. With that said, I wish you all a fun farewell, and I will see you all. Well, hear you all next week. <laughs>